All right, everyone, welcome to our March 2024 OTC webinar, Approaches to Common Licenses. Um, a couple of housekeeping rules before we get started. Please do ensure that your microphones are muted as we are recording the webinar today. Um, we also have live captioning available, so you do have the option to turn that on as well. Um, we will be sending a recording out to everyone that's registered, so keep an eye out in your emails for a link to our YouTube channel. Um, and then finally, if you have any questions at all during the webinar, feel free to use the Q&A box below to drop your questions and we will get to them at the end of the presentation. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Matt Upton, Senior Associate Director for Intellectual Property Development and Zach Stacy, our Intellectual Property Manager. I'll turn it over to them. Thank you very much, Rohan. And thanks everyone for attending. Um, essentially, today we're going to be talking about approach, approaches to common licenses. I will say, initially, we were going to, going to call it the do's and don'ts of common licenses, but then we decided um, we just want approaches because we don't want to give you hard and strict uh, guidelines for this, other than come talk to us because it can get pretty complicated. Next one, Zach. Yeah. So, <clears throat> Mainly, we want to focus in on software. Um, there are common licenses for other forms, and we'll talk about those very briefly. But for the most part, we're looking at software protection. So typically in the United States, we have two ways to protect software. One, patent. Um, and for a lot of my career as a patent attorney, it was kind of the Wild West. You could do almost anything as long as you said, it was stored on a hard drive in a computer and a computer was doing something. And then you can put the functionality of the software. All that changed in 2014 with this case uh, called Alice versus CLS Bank. We just affectionately refer to it in the patent arts as Alice. But essentially what it said is that invention should be more than an abstract idea. Um, and that if the invention is directed to an abstract idea, that it must include or claim additional elements that transform the abstract idea into a patent eligible application. So this became what's known as the transformative step that we need to file software patents. And what that transform means is, does it improve the computer functionality in some way, right? Meaning, is it enabling certain computations that were previously unavailable? Does it speed up processes or require fewer resources? And fewer resources is the computer's resources, right? Maybe you've developed a software that it doesn't, a computer doesn't have to use its RAM as much in doing some application as it had previously done. Or it solves a computing challenge in an unconventional way. Now, if many of you are looking at that and go, huh, it doesn't really do the first, does it do the second? Well, that's what courts fight about all the time uh, because the Supreme Court um, did not give really good guidance as to what a transformative step actually is. Um, but patents are still available if it meets these prompts. But the most common version type of protection we have for software is copyright. So we have common law copyright, uh, which is automatic. You know, it, it happens automatically at the time the code is fixed in a readable medium, meaning you could write down the code. You could actually code it into a computer. Um, as long as someone else could read it or a machine could read it, you have a copyright. Um, and the author, which is what copyright's concerned with, is the person that writes the code. Not the person that comes up with the idea, um, not the person that kind of designs what the graphical interface looks like for the most part, but the person that actually writes the code to do what the program is meant to do. Um, so that's a common law copyright. So that happens automatically. And or we can file with the copyright office. Um, and it's typically registered as a literary work. Um, which sounds odd, but that's what it is, right? It's a series of typed out letters and numbers. Um, it does have a functional aspect that it performs something, but anyone that's ever coded knows that there's a lot of different ways to write code to get to the same end result. 
And it's that difference is what the copyright is capturing. Um, and as I said, it's the most common form of software protection. Next one, Zach. All right, so we have these, when we're looking at common licenses, we kind of have these two different sides of, of the spectrum, right? We have open source licenses and creative common licenses. Um, today we'll be focused mainly in on the open source licenses, but this kind of wouldn't be complete without talking about the creative commons. So open source licenses are software licenses that allow content to be used, modified, or shared, mainly dealing with software. And there are two main categories that we'll get in that Zach will get into a little later: permissive and copy left. In addition, these type of licenses usually require attribution. So whoever originally worked on the um, the code needs to be attributed with its creation. Uh, and then we go over to the Creative Commons license. So it's a public copyright license that enables the free distribution of a copyrighted work. And even the, the groups behind the Creative Commons license recommend that you do not use Creative Commons license for software. So that's what the open source licenses are for. And with the Creative Commons license, you typically have some baseline rights attributed to them. So you have attribution, share alike, which means however you were able to use it is how you, whatever restrictions are there are the restrictions you have to pass on and anything you have sourced from someone else under one of these Creative Commons licenses. So those same restrictions you have to pass on to any derivatives um, or anything you've added. Um, typically non-commercial, so you can't take uh, something under a Creative Commons license and then start selling it. Uh, and it typically allows for those derivative works. Um, next one. Or is that... Is that just the same? There we are. Um... And I think this is now, I'll turn it over to Zach and let him take over. Yep, yeah, thanks, Matt. Uh, <clears throat> so just kind of an overview on the open source license part, that left column, um, really split into two, which is kind of your first, when you're deciding what license to release under, um, if you go on like the open source initiative, it's kind of mostly be split between copyleft and permissive licenses. Um, as far as the most common the MIT, uh, is a permissive license and things like the GLP are, uh, are copyleft. Um, so a copyleft license allows users to use, modify, and share the work under the condition that the reciprocity of the obligation is maintained. So it kind of stays with the software as it's redistributed. Um, components with a copyleft license require users to make their code open for use by others as well. So if you received it as such, you will dis distribute it the way you received it and so on. So it's like Linux. You can't have a private use of Linux software. It's under GLP. You have the same responsibilities of those before you've contributed to it. So dependencies with permissive licenses like MIT, Apache, ISC, and VSD allow you to license your project wherever you want though. So you can then, after you've taken something under a different license, use a copyleft license. On the other side of the spectrum is a permissive license. Um, these give users the freedom to use, modify, redistribute, allow propriety, proprietary derivative works while placing minimal obligations or restrictions on users. So that's kind of an overbroad. They're all gonna have their own ways of, of managing commercial use or private use, or but that's kind of just the gist of the permissive side of the spectrum. So a main problem in both of these, it's kind of arisen in the last 15 or so years, um, has been these patent clauses pop up in these. Um, we were at Autumn, which is the trade association for check transfer offices. And this was like the main topic of conversation at a lot of these sub panels, mostly non-lawyers, mostly horrified of these because they mentioned patents. Um, industry prefers them. Um, so a good example is the Apache 2.0, which is a permissive license traditionally, but was kind of the first to include a, a, a patent express patent license included in the the text of the uh, open source license. Um, I'm not going to read it, but there's some some key things in here. It permits a grant of a patent license, uh, gives you perpetual worldwide non-exclusive, no charge, royalty free, irrevocable um, patent license to make, have use, 
um, have made, use, offer to sell, import. So basically you have a license to the underlying patents of the software that you're going to use, which is huge for someone who's going to take whatever work and then contribute. If we're saying the main point of open source is collaboration um, across content creators, um, it's something you kind of want. If you're going to put all your time resources into modifying software, you don't want to then have to worry if someone's going to enforce patent rights against you. Um, software license to solve a small category of patent problems, though. Um, doesn't mean you still can't get sued for infringement if one of these is included in there. Um, and they're usually brought up in, in two contexts. There's usually a grant proponent of the, the license that grants you your rights, and there's a retaliation clause that then terminates the rights if you then pursue your own patent on your modifications and then try to use those offensively against other users. So uh, I clicked Betty's title, but uh, tech terms officers are mostly wrong about these. Uh, we're not afraid of the new licenses that are coming out that have these patent clauses. Um, it's kind of part of the, we're encouraging people to come talk to us about what software they have, what their goals are, so we can then find out what licenses are best. We're also seeing these brought up in grants and publishing requirements to use certain licenses. So we don't want people to automatically be afraid that they're losing their ability to patent their software because the license that they're pushing forward has a patent clause in it. Um, so popular licenses, the MIT license, which is most widely used of perm permissive licenses, and the BSD were created during uh, the late 90s when software patents were not that common and it was pretty murky waters. So they didn't include express licenses in their text. I mean, their text is also only about five sentences long. Um, so they didn't, they didn't have express li licenses, but courts have deemed them to have implied licenses. Um, there's also other legal doctrines of estoppel and, and patent exhaustion that kind of pop up as well. Um, no major open source license contains uh, a reservation of lights except for MLP2, MPL2. So like on the other side of the spectrum, Rarely is someone granting a patent, granting an open source license that says, actually, we're going to retain our ability to sue you for patent infringement. Uh, so there's always kind of been this in between. Um, the Apache license. Um, so a major thing that's brought up in these contexts is we don't want to give all our background IP away. You know, these patent clauses, they're going to they're going to try to get our other software that may or may not be looped into this software package. And it pretty expressly says that where such license applies to those patent claims, lights sold by such contributor that are necessarily infringed by their contributions. So in non-legalese, if you're contributing, you're given a license to whatever patents that may underlie what you're contributing to. Um, it's not anything additional, and that's usually been construed pretty narrowly. Um, retaliation clauses, um, we'll get into later, but it revokes the license in case a software user themselves raises a patent infringement claim against the open source software. So this is some fear of patent trolling. Um, if you don't, uh, if you include this in there, we're giving people this license, what are they going to do with this license? Well, we know that they can't retaliate because we're taking away their license if they do. Um, a major consideration for this, and I think which is where tech transfer offices slip up on this is, uh, we want collaborations across the world. Uh, in our software, when we're putting it in these repositories, um, we want collaborators who are going to use it. And if we don't express these pat these express patent rights, then who knows what courts in other countries are going to say about their ability to use or freely use, or, or really, it's their worry. Someone who has two options of software and knows that they can freely use a software versus it's kind of murky waters on if they're going to be sued for infringement, they're going to use the one that they know is free and clear. So that's kind of our motivation to kind of embrace these to a degree is to kind of promote that collaboration going forward. Um, so I thought a good way of highlighting this is going through the MIT license. It's super short. So in the left column is the whole text of the MIT license, kind of demystify what these things are saying. Um, you can read them. Um, you don't have to go to law school to kind of understand what a lot of these words mean. You might have to to kind of understand their long implications, but it's pretty straightforward. This is a copy and paste that you're gonna put at the bottom of your software. So permission, permissions hereby granted, um, granting permission for if tree of software. Um, so it's who's subject to the license and who's benefiting uh, to deal in the software without restriction. This is where we get that implied patent license. Um, looks like I'm <clears throat> coming in out here. Um, this is where we get the implied patent license. If we're telling a person that they can use the software without restriction, we then kind of foreclose our ability to sue them if they're using it in compliance with the license we're giving them, um, including without limitation. Um, it's pretty straightforward that we're about to give them a license that they can then contribute to and freely use um, the rights to use. We're giving them a pretty uh, broad exclusive rights to use under the copyright. Um, and then just the rest is just a kind of boilerplate warranty. 
Um, so kind of just an encouragement to kind of read, uh, read the software that you're using and kind of figure out, hey, what, what's going on here or, or contact our office if it's it's murky, which it often is. So here's just kind of highlighting the difference of, so if you go on an open source initiative, it'll tell you if it has a patent grant or not in the license. Um, here's how different those can be. Um, so the Apache 2.0 patent grant applies to the entire work and it's patents infringed by contributions. Um, CDDL is, is similar, but different patents infringed by con contributed software. So that's limited to just the contributions and the grant applies to contributions or a combination of that software and other software. Um, so on the copy left side though, GPL3 added the patent clause of GPL2, uh, patents infringed by contributors version. So it's limited just to the version of the contributor. I'm not gonna the rest of these, but as you can see, it, it varies between these, these licenses, um, what kind of rights you get under that. Um, then the defensive side, which is that retaliation if, if these rights are used. Um, so under the Apache 2.0, there's a trigger if a claim, um, which includes cross claims and counterclaims, accusing the work of direct contributor patent infringement occurs, then all patent grants from all contributors are terminated under the license. So the license that we distributed under then no longer applies to the underlying software. Um, now this differs across the board. You have a cure period under the CDDL, GPL3, um, it's just any patent claim and all rights are terminated. Um, and then there's some unclear ones, the BSD plus patent, which is less used. It was basically the BSD plus a patent clause, um, kind of unsure what's going on there, uh, which kind of leads us to, uh, it, when in doubt, don't make your own license. Um, I, I, there's plenty of motivations from people on Reddit pages to GitHub that say, I made the perfect license. Um, don't, um, it's not widely adopted. People often won't use a license if they don't, um, aren't familiar with it, um, or it's not approved by the open source initiative. Um, so this is just kind of brings this up the conflicts, and multiple dependencies. Um, so earlier I had linked the security report open source software. Um, they, they reported that although it's down 53% of licenses on code bases, um, had some sort of discrepancy in the licensing that they have in the underlying software. Um, as more and more software adopts open source components, this is really important. Um, if we did an audit today of UK technology, we'd probably find some discrepancies. We'd almost certainly find discrepancies. Um, it's easy to fall into. Um, so there's a kind of a simple rule of thumb is that permissive licenses are traditionally compatible with each other. So first and foremost, it, the license that you got it under will almost always be a license you can distribute it under. So if you used MIT license, you received it through a repository that was using MIT license, you can then release it under an MIT license. You're safe there. Um, it's then when you start mixing of, hey, what license do we want to release our modifications under is when it starts to get a little dicey. Permissive licenses are normally compatible with copyleft licenses. This little chart on the right kind of points out which ones work with which and now, even then it's a little murky. Um, and kind of depends on your own personal strategy. Um, so the most problematic practice is usually the combining of two copyleft licenses. So that's, it pops up. It's pretty common common sense when you do think about it. If you're using GPL2 um, and it says must release any derivations or additions under a GPL2 license, you then can't add a piece of software that has a conflicting license. So you're adding a component that has GPL3 and says must be released under a GPL3 license. You can't release a software under two licenses at once. So therefore you have a conflict. Um, it limits your ability to use either software. You have to make a choice or you have to then get approval. And we'll talk about kind of what, what contractual options you have there later on. So a, a takeaway from that is one, if you think you're running into this, you should approach your office and we can try to help you out. We can with agreements that can take away the existing licenses and allow you the freedom to release under where license you want to release it under, or um, kind of what solutions are on how to use both pieces separately and release them under the license that you're obligated to under the underlying license. So under the combination the point, we're using a GPL2 and a GPL3, um, you would have to release each part separately um, and not use the underlying licenses from the conflicting ones. Um, which starts to get a little dicey. It's, it's complicated and I think it's complicated for a reason. It's so people release compliant with the underlying license. Um, so additional contributor agreements. So this is how you get around it. Um, 
So there's I put three instances here, but one of the main ones is to use a different license th than the software came with. So we can help get you the right to release under a different license if we contact all the contributors. So in some circumstances, in academic circumstances, if it's it's more limited, it's only a couple contributors, that's more doable. Obviously, if you're getting off GitHub, there might be hundreds of contributors. It's much more difficult. Each country has its own um, copyright granting statutes. Some require all contributors to sign away under whatever, sign away the right to either the copyright or to permit you to change the license. Some it's a majority, um, something we'd have to have a conversation about if, on a case by case basis. But uh, situations where this would pop up is your project uses an open source license that does not include an express patent grant and you want to use it and you want to make sure that someone's not going to um, sue you if you incorporate this in a pro uh, like a product or a patent that you're going to file. Um, we may want to go get a uh, get something in writing that says that they're giving you a, a license to whatever underlying patents that are covered by that copyright. Um, your project is under a copy left license, but you also need to distribute a proprietary version of the project. So as we discussed earlier, copy left licenses normally require you to then publish your contributions under the same license. Well, if you're, if you're trying to commercialize this, if you're trying to um, find potential industry partners, they may not want their um integration of the software to be public um so how do we get around that public disclosure using under the license requirement we get a get an agreement with the underlying contributors to usually it's some sort of license usually they want some sort of compensation probably um to then be able to release this under a different license um so you'll need every contributor to sign copyright to uk um, under a permissive license. Um, and you think you might need to change license over its lifetime. This is more of just a due diligence. Um, so if you are creating software all in-house and you have, I know, grad students or other people contributing, um, you want to get all your, all your copyright information assigned to, to UK. So we do have the ability to then change licenses that we release it over time. Uh, when that starts to get disparate and spread out and people move, it gets much harder to change your licensing scheme as it happens. So grant requirements, something that comes up a lot. Um, different uh, government entities require different kinds of uh, open source um, releases. Um, so the NSF, uh, a common common language in, in their grant stuff, it's all under their pathways to enable open source ecosystems plan. Um, so their requirements are pretty broad. The NIH and NSF are super broad on these where the NSF is, it must be publicly accessible via an open source license. Uh, and it must have some external third party users. Usually there's a time period for contributions. Um, I think, I don't know how they enforce that, but they're just making sure that you've released this thing. Um, and the open source license that you can choose is anyone that's approved by the open source initiative. So that's over a hundred licenses, vastly different um, in what rights they enable and give. Um, so you have a lot of freedom. So don't be scared if you see on a grant requirement says must make source code uh, they will be open source. You have a lot of options there. Um, the NIH is very similar. Um, they they do give some guidelines of when not to. Um, so they're kind of dicey on if you're pursuing patent protection, they obviously want to retain, um, they want to protect that prosecution and they don't want you to disclose too early to foreclose any rights you may later have to obtaining a patent under that software. Um, so again, disclosures to our office, we can kind of consult you on that. Uh, we can get a provisional in before you release it open source and we can kind of get a plan together. Um, but very similar with NSF, you know, it just needs to be open, available, pick an OSI license. And I, I don't think the NIH re requires some sort of external third party, but theoretically, if it's open, available, it's, if, it's available if it's available to the general public, someone's going to use it and download it. Um, NASA had a different one to kind of, can uh, kind of show some contrast between the NSF and NIH. They do have a list of licenses they want you to use, which does greatly restrict um, commercialization later down the line and the rights of contributors later down the line. So um, their policy, uh, the, the one that I found restricted certain permissive licensing um, when no other restrictions exist, so that, that, that's meaning you're not using software that has other licenses underlying and you don't have other grants that require different things, um, which, Honestly, it's helpful. That's permissive and not copyleft, but uh, they have a list that they give on their grants. So just be be mindful when uh, when using this stuff on what kind of language is included, because um, there's a pretty big spectrum there. Uh, patents and open source. So this is something that also we run into a lot of 
Uh, there's kind of a false dichotomy of I want to release my software to the general public, maybe because you received another permissive license and you feel like you want everyone, you, you feel like you owe that duty to everyone else, or, and you feel like maybe getting a patent would uh, stand in the way of kind of the, the underlying ethos of open source. Um, but uh, we're here to say that it doesn't. Um, often, most widely adopted open source software, there is a patent somewhere in the mix. Um, it helps you enforce your rights. Um, so defensively, uh, if you have a patent on the software that you didn't release open source, you can sue for infringement against someone who's um, maybe not following your license to a T, um, which is very helpful if you you know limit commercial use. Someone's using commercially, you have a patent, you can easily sue for patent infringement for that. Um, defensively, it protects you if someone uh, modifies your software to a level that's patentable and then gets a patent on their own. Um, you want to be able to protect your use of your software. You know, they would still have their patent on their integration of your software, but you'd be protected, kind of fr free to operate under your existing license and your existing standards. Um, patent plus copy left is another strategy um, that helps from a commercialization standpoint. Um, it's a pretty common question. Why would someone want to obtain a patent on an invention that's going to be distributed under GPL? Um, so the author may plan to license the patent to others to produce a revenue stream. The author may want to assert his patent rights against redistributors who do not conform with the license, kind of brought up earlier. Um, those who violate the license, it's easier to enforce a patent against them. Uh, the author may want to have patent rights to use as an offensive defense weapon against infringers who are not using the GPL software. And the author may plan to also distribute a non-GPL version of the software. That's a strategy that we would probably like to use more often where you know, you want to make it available open source and we'll put it out there under a copy left, but we retain the right to have industry partners where we use inventors know how and their data and their ability to modify the software for industry clients or other universities. And we can release it to them without the restrictions of a copy left GPL license and they can use it commercially for their own research, whatever it may be. Um, and then how we can help. Um, Matt, you want to? Oh, on that. <laughs> yep. Um, so, you know, one of the things our office does is help with these type of situations when software has been developed here at UK, and we can even help to answer the question of you want to use software, right? <clears throat> so we can look at those strategies for distribution and protection, right? Do we want to go patent? Do we want to go permissive? Do we want to go copy left? Do we want to combine patent and copy left? Um, and then how does that interact with the grants that you've received? Um, we can also help with addressing conflicts in existing licenses, right? <clears throat> you've come up with this software, but you pulled from various sources, open source um, code that's out there. It may be under different codes. As Zach mentioned, we can work with you to try to make sure we can distribute and get it out there like we need to kind of ask for alterations to the existing licenses that are on the the code that you used, um, um, that kind of dovetails into the next one, which is the evaluation of the OSSUs and development of innovation. And that doesn't even have to be after you've come up with your own code, right? If you know you want to use some of that code, you can come in and let us know, hey, I want to use this piece and this piece off GitHub. And, but this one's under this license, license this one's under this license, is that fine? And we can kind of go over that. As Zach mentioned, you know, using a permissive with a permissive is fine. It's when you start mixing in the copy lefts with one another, it becomes problematic. Uh, we can also look at the authorship evaluations. Um, you know, who did what um, and determine, you know, especially in the software that had a lot of different contributions. Where did it come from? What license were they under? Who should be on this? And then once you have that finished product, our office can help with, you know, what's the best open source license for your technology, right? For the code that you've developed, um, taking into account the grant that you have uh, and what the overall end goals are for the software itself. Um, so those are all ways that our office can help with this. Um, it's one of those topics that we would like to make it simple, but the, the reality is it's not a simple topic. Right, it's one where we really have to dig in, take a look, and there's a lot of pitfalls. Um, in the statistics you saw throughout the presentation, 
you know, over half of all the software that's out there essentially kind of gets this wrong, right? And with so much technology now being, so much software being based on open source um, software, it's important to get it right, uh, especially it's a way that courts are ruling. Um, but I guess now we can take any questions that anyone has. As a reminder, if anyone has any questions, please drop them in the Q&A box below. Um, the first question is, does it matter which programming language we use? Uh, I don't I don't think it matters which language unless there's something in that language that has a license associated with it, right? If it's a proprietary license and has one of these common licenses. So it's more an issue of what license is attached to that code than it is what language that code is in, whether it's Python or, you know, however many other licenses there are. Um, it's it's really all about what license it's under. It's also, there's a weird like industry adoption with it. Like Python has an affinity using Apache 2.0. And mm -hmm. I know Java has an affinity for MIT licenses, both permissive, um, but it's just depending on that. And it's also the copyright is based on just the written text. So it's not even when you're executing it, it's not anything else. So that's why it, it doesn't matter what the language is. A good question. And then there was a follow-up question there. Um, this person said that they made a big project and some problems were coded by students. Um, they don't want to continue this research. So should they sign an ad agreement with each of them anyway? When you say ad agreement, what are you talking about, I guess? I'm sorry, yes. Can I just speak like yeah. that? Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. So this is, I, I meant like additional agreements you told during the presentation. Okay, mm -hmm. so so I guess, you know, this is one of those things that if you think something has been created, it should come into our office, whether or not you want to continue it or not, because one of the things we want to do is determine authorship because deter like because if those students coded that it depends on what capacity they coded it to determine who has ownership right me as an employee of the university of kentucky if i go out and write code that's going to belong to uk right mm -hmm. um a graduate student that is receiving um you know, stipends or things like that from the university that goes and creates code will likely be owned by the University of Kentucky. If there's undergrad students working on code for a class that may or may not be owned by the University of Kentucky. Um, so we just need to go in and evaluate and see what those students did under what capacity they did and go from there. But have, have you already disclosed to us? Um, I'm in process, you know. Okay. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So yeah, just get it in and then we can evaluate it. That's, you know, on that slide of how we can help is that determine authorship to determine who has the rights to it. And it may just be a combination, um, which can happen a lot of the times as well. I see. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. All right, the next question is, can I change the license of an open source invention once it's out there? That seems all you yeah. said. Yeah, I can use that. Um, so yes, you can. Um, it's tricky. Um, so there's two things. Retroactively, someone who's downloaded your software will have it under the existing license. Um, you can change it. Um, a, if you have the right, so if it's not using software that limits your ability to release it under a different license. Um, but you should be free to, to release it under whatever license you want to. Obviously, easier under a permissive license like MIT, harder under um, any other copy left that then requires whatever you're releasing under. But uh, I think the main point is whatever you're releasing under earlier, whoever downloaded it under that existing license still has the rights under that license. Now, anyone else you release it to would have it under your selected license. Um, this happens often when you're gonna give it to industry partners, um, you'll give it to them under a different license. Matt, I think this one's for you. If software is offered under open source licenses, what strategies are being used to monetize this technology? So 
So that is one of the things that people always worry about when they talk about these open source licenses, right? Because as you talked about some, you know, as we looked at some of them, you know, the whole point is to freely distribute these, right? So get them in the hands of individuals. Um, so you really can't monetize that if you're giving away for free um, a lot of times. So what other institutions are doing and what our office is tending to do at this point is is say, all right, you have free access to that software, but that software needs integrated with your current systems that you have. And, and that is where we're looking to potentially monetize to bring money back in for you to keep doing research and things like that. Um, it's in that integration work. Is that additional work? Yeah, it is. Will it be paid for? Yeah, it should be, right? So that's how we're looking to try to, to monetize these things you know, with the NIH and NSF requiring things to be put out open source, it's kind of limiting what we can do. Um, but that integration and is likely always needed, and you're the expert in that code. Um, so that's how we plan to do this in the future, and it's how other institutions are currently doing it. And then finally, what's the bare minimum I need to do to call my project open source? Yeah, this this crops up a lot, I feel like, because everyone means different things when they say open source. Um, so I feel like just to define the like baseline of it is often key. So there's the grants obviously define it by just using an open source license that's pre-approved. Um, and I think at UK, that should probably be our definition as well. Um, the open source initiative goes through, it's a nonprofit, they go through licenses every year and they approve ones that you know, comply with their ability in order to, for them to approve it, it has to have some sort of free to use, free to modify language in there. Um, and I think that's a good baseline for open source. Um, anytime you're putting something out under a different license that may not be widely adopted, no one has any idea if they can use it and how to use it. And it's also, I think it's safe. I think it's something that comes up a lot is if you put out software without a license, no one can use it. Um, so I think that's always a great guideline for people who are like, ah, I released it. It's like, no, it needs to have it needs to have some sort of license so people can adopt it and use it and know that they're free to use it. So I just the baseline would you be use one of those open source initiative licenses that's available online. Fantastic. Um, well, I think that about wraps it up. I want to thank you, Matt and Zach, for a super informative webinar. Um, as I mentioned to everyone, a recording will be available on our YouTube channel shortly after today, so we will send that link out, um, as well as a PDF version of the slides from today's presentation. Um, Zach, if you don't mind going up to the next slide. It's lagging out on me. There we go. Ah. <laughs> Uh, I do want to quickly remind everyone that the Kentucky Innovator Challenge is happening on April 11th. Um, this is a one-day event designed to inspire Kentucky researchers, innovators, and entrepreneurs by sharing some of the biggest challenges and unmet needs for businesses around the region. If you haven't already, feel free to check out the um, registration link below um, by scanning that QR code. Um, and there's more information on our website as far as the agenda and presenter information for the day. Um, and then if you can go to that last slide, um, follow us on social media, subscribe to our newsletter for regular updates on upcoming webinars, events, and any other information regarding UK Innovate and OTC. Again, thank you all for joining us. Um, hope you have a great day and we will see you at our next webinar.